Good morning, church. How many of you are excited to be here in the house of the Lord? Amen. Amen. If you can please stand up, we're going to sing some praises to the Lord. We're going to celebrate what Jesus did for us when he saved us. Amen. me sing it out Jesus is alive the empty cross the empty grave life eternal you have won the day shout it out Jesus is alive he's alive Good morning. Good morning. Man, that's the greatest sound I get to hear every Sunday morning. It just shows that you're excited to be here. You are? Yeah. All right. I'll, I'll take that as a yes. Uh, but we are. We're glad that you're here. Hey, any visitors that are with us today and you didn't get checked in in the lobby and we meet some of our wonderful people, um, hey, all right. Hey, Drew, how you doing, man? Uh, well, hey, if you, uh, sorry about that. Uh, it's all an old friend. Um, hey, uh, if you didn't uh, greet someone in the lobby, you can uh, scan on your phone the little card behind one of the seats. That'll welcome, uh, give you the, uh, show you how to be on our page, and that will allow us to know you a little bit better and you to know us a little bit better, know, find out what's going on at the point when there's a lot of stuff happening here at the point. And we're so glad that you're here. You know, a week after Easter, the place was full last week, and you guys are doing pretty good today. Um, well, hey, we want to commit this service to the Lord and just remember that during the service, just be very respectful and just, hey, 
all of us need to hear whatever has been put on Pastor Branson's heart. There's a new series starting today, uh, and so I'm excited. I hope you're excited. Let's commit this service to prayer. Join or join. Or, Commit it to the Lord, but join me in prayer. Father, thank you for all that you've done, all that you're doing, and all that you're about to do, Lord, just in the next hour. We thank you so much. And Lord, we just ask you to bless all that are here, bless that are, those that are online, and just move any obstacle out of our way that we may have brought in with us today. Just move it, take it from our shoulders, take it from our hearts, take it from our minds, and just clear the way to be able to receive your message this morning, Lord. And I just ask you, to move through the praise team as they continue to just lift us up to praise you, Lord. Prepare our hearts for worship. And then, of course, uh, the message that Pastor Branch is so excited about. Lord, I just pray it pierces hearts and minds this morning and just lifts us all and tells us all, leaving here, what we need to do to reach others for the kingdom. And we thank you in advance for what you're about to do. It's in Jesus' name I ask, and everyone said, Amen. Thank you.
like you, Lord. There is no one like you. That's why we praise you, Lord. Your name is great. Your name is powerful. We adore you, Lord. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries at his voice and trembles at his voice how great Thank you, Lord.
Exalt your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, Jesus. Now we pray, Lord, that you may use Pastor Branson to deliver your message this morning to all of us. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive it. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, praise team. They did a wonderful job, didn't they? <clears throat> Amen. May the name of Jesus be lifted higher and higher and higher. And I pray that that is your desire today as a Christian to honor and glorify and praise the Lord in everything that we would say and everything that we would do. And you know that falls right into the series that we're beginning here this morning. Brand new series God's laid on my heart. And um, you may have uh, seen the bracelets as you were given one. Uh, hopefully when you came in Today, I got mine as I came out of my office, and it is uh, WWJD, 
and that is, what would Jesus do? Amen. You remember these from a long time ago? Yep. This, was a, this was a real big thing back many, many years ago. And it absolutely transformed so, so many Christian lives. And you know, I don't think that something like this is ever, ever outdated. Because once we receive Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we as a Christian, we need to ask ourselves this every moment of every day. What would Jesus do? Why should we do that, Pastor? Because when we ask Jesus to come in to be our Lord and Savior, we come, we become a brand new person in Him. It's not supposed to be our desires. Now it is supposed to be His desires. Amen. We've got a brand new way of walking, a brand new way of talking, a brand new way of making decisions, a brand new way of treating people, a brand new way of doing every single thing in life. But guess what? Just because we got saved doesn't mean that the old person has gone away. You have the old person inside of you. I have the old person inside of me. We will always have the old person inside of us until we get to heaven. There is always going to be a constant battle in our own hearts and spirits with the new creation we are in Jesus and the old person that we were before we met Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And the reason for that is Satan doesn't want us to ever, ever glorify Jesus in our life. He wants us to glorify the old nature, which was the nature that Satan gave us. It was a nature before Jesus came in and made a brand new creation out of our life. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise the Lord for the resurrection that we celebrated last Sunday. I will tell you this. We are happy today if we know Jesus as Lord and Savior because Jesus loved us enough to go to the cross, down the cross, shed his blood, raise again on the third day because he loves each and every one of us. So this morning, we're starting a brand new series, and the series is, What Would Jesus Do? What would Jesus do? And we're looking at it from a lot of different facets, and this morning we'll share with you where we're going in just a minute. But the author of the book, In His Steps, was written by Charles Sheldon years ago. If you have not read that book, you need to read that book, and we will have copies of that book, free copies of that book, right as soon as our worship service ends today. You can pick up one before you leave. But that book was all about a community that was uh, around it by a church and a pastor that decided that he was going to ask his church, what would Jesus do? He asked the congregation in his church, he said, listen, Every one of us need to make a decision in our lives. And that is, no matter what we think, no matter what we do, we need to ask ourselves 24-7, what would Jesus do? He said, if you will do that, if you will follow me in this, more importantly, follow Jesus in this, if you will do this, it will absolutely transform your life and it will transform this church, and it will transform the community that this church is around. So if you watch the movie or if you read the book, you will see that there were some people in that church that did not want to have anything to do with this. They didn't want to have anything to do because they thought that this decision in life was way, way too radical. I mean, they would have to give up this, they would have to give up this, because they, would, they wouldn't want that kind of living every single day. Now think about it for a second. You say, I don't know how they would turn that down. Well, folks, let me tell you something that you already know. Our nature, we were born selfish. Every one of us, amen? When you came out of your mama's womb, you were born selfish. You were born all about you. You know why I know that? You know why I know that on my own? <clears throat> because when I wanted a bottle, I screamed. <laughs> when I wanted food, I screamed. Amen. When I wanted a particular toy, I screamed. And you did the same thing. You know why? It didn't make any difference what your parents was doing. 
It didn't make any difference what your brothers and sisters were doing. You wanted food, and you wanted it now. Maybe your diaper was full, and you wanted it changed right here, right now. I want you to snap to attention when I ask of something. I want that toy, and I want it now. You still see that, not only with kids, but you also see that with adults. Just because you're a Christian today doesn't mean you're not selfish. We live in a very, very selfish society. We live in a society that doesn't want to have anything to do with what I'm talking with you about this morning. And Christian people can be the worst when it comes to being selfish. You wouldn't think that, but it's true. Christ says, I have not saved you that you could be a selfish person. I have saved you. You've come to know me as Lord and Savior. So now it's not all about what you want. It's all about what I want. In order to do that, folks, we have got to transform from being selfish to selfless. The Bible says there is no greater love than any of us can have this morning than for us to lay down our life for others. What does that mean? That means that in every way that we live, we put others ahead of us. In everything, we put others ahead of us. We put others ahead of our preferences. We put others ahead of our decisions and things like that. But why do we do that? Because we want to be the same as Jesus. What did Jesus do? Even though he was the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he put others in front of everything that he wanted. He showed us how to live a true selfless life. And when that happens, folks, we start seeing people like Jesus sees people. I will tell you today, there are not many churches, there are not many Christians today that truly see people as Jesus sees people people. What do you mean? When Jesus sees people, he sees people the same way he sees you and I. And you know what that is? He sees us through the lens of loving us unconditionally. He loves us today with all of our faults, with all of our imperfections, with all of our skeletons, with all of our secrets, with all of the things that are going on today in our lives. He loves us unconditionally. When he was on this earth, when he walked around, he saw people from every walk of life. He saw people with all kinds of hang-ups. You know, we think we look at people today and we would say, those people look a little weird. I'll tell you something. They had weird-looking people in Jesus' day. They had weird-acting people in Jesus' day. Yeah, they did. What are you saying, Pastor? There have always been people on the face of this earth that when you and I look at them, we say, what in the world is going on with those people? But you know what Jesus did? He showed us how to look past that and never judge a book by its cover, to always give somebody the benefit of the doubt, to always look at people and say, I don't know what that person's going through. I don't know what that person has come through. I am not walking in those people's shoes. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to love those people like Jesus loved those people. How did Jesus love? He loved unconditionally. He saw value in every single person that he saw. And can I say this to you today? There is value in every single person that you and I will ever see in our life. Amen. Amen. They are people, regardless of what we think. They are people that Jesus died for on the cross and shed his blood for just like he did for you and me. Amen. Amen. He loves us unconditionally, so he asks us to love people unconditionally. He wants us to see value in every single person and to start asking ourselves when we encounter people that we want to judge, when we encounter people that don't look like us, when we encounter people 
that don't act like us, when we encounter people that don't have the same moral values as you and I, people that do it different, people that are walking a different life than us, we folks need to love those people. If we don't love those people, we are not showing them the love that Jesus wants us to be showing those people. Praise God, this church has become, through the years, it has become a what-would-Jesus-do church. And what I mean by that is this. We have become a whosoever-will church. Everybody is welcomed in this church. Every single person. It doesn't make any difference how many tattoos you have. It doesn't make any difference how many piercings you have. It doesn't make any difference what kind of car you drive, the, church, the house that you live in, your bank account. It doesn't make any difference how you dress. It doesn't make any difference how you smell. I will tell you this. This church has been transformed by the glory of God into a church that readily accepts anybody that comes inside those doors. It hasn't always been that way. But it is now. Amen. Amen. Why? Because we, I pray, as a congregation, I pray we have the love of Jesus in our hearts. I pray that we love people the same way Jesus loved us. Jesus didn't ask us to get cleaned up before we came to find him as Lord and Savior. He took us just as we are. And some of the most precious people that I've ever met in my whole entire ministry have been people that this world shuns. And a sad fact, some of the greatest people I've met in this world have been people that even churches have shunned. We have got people in this church right now, this morning, right here, right now, as I look at this congregation, I could start pointing out some people right now that I know some things about their life that you don't know. Or maybe they've shared your, their testimony with you. But there are people that are coming to this church right here and right now that have not been welcomed in churches in Pinellas County. Yes, that's true. You say, Pastor, what do you mean? I'm trying to say they didn't welcome them in because maybe they had a, a child that was challenged. Maybe they had a teenager that was challenged. Maybe somebody else had a handicap. Maybe somebody else had too many piercings. Maybe somebody else had too many tattoos. Maybe some else, somebody else always dressed in rags. Hey, I'm trying to tell you that I've always said this all my ministry. Christian people are the only ones that shoot their wounded. That's the truth. I will tell you that's true. I hear it all the time. I'm not going to church. Why aren't you going to church? Because I wasn't accepted in that church. I'd like to have a, a, just an out and out with any of them pastors. I really would. I really would. Because I would tell them they need to retire. They need to retire. They need to get out of the ministry. Any church that will not open their doors to anybody, red and yellow, black and white, I will tell you they are all precious in Jesus' sight. And the main problem we've got in this world is not the unsaved people. It's Christians. They are Christians walking around in churches today. Praise God, I don't think we have any here. And the reason we don't is because they've all gone down the road. Some of them have asked to go down the road. Some of them have said, we're not going to do it this way. I said, well, you're not going to do it your way here. So go on down the road. Go to another church. Go to another church that wants to judge people. We're not going to judge people here. And the reason we're not is because we're going to do what Jesus wants us to do. Why? Because God has given to us. And I want you to listen. God has given to us as a congregation, as a body of Christ. And you know when I say the word church, it means all of us that know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not only here, but all across the whole entire world. But he has given us, and I'm going to talk about our church right here. He has given all of us today an unbelievable opportunity. I want you to think about this. You and I could have been born at any other time in the world. You today could be at any other church around. But you're not. You're here. Everybody here, 
that knows the Lord. You have been gifted. You have been talented. And listen to me. To do something in life, to do something in life that nobody can do quite like you. There are other pastors, but nobody preaches like I do, and they're probably very thankful they don't. But I will tell you something. Nobody can pastor like I can. You know why? Because I'm unique. And Vicki thanks God for that. Listen, hey, I am unique. David Jeremiah is David Jeremiah. Charles Stanley is Charles Stanley. Billy Graham is Billy Graham. But Pastor Branson is Pastor Branson. Amen. And you, you are who you are today. You're who you are, gifted of God, but you have the same mission in life that I do. And you know what that is? It's not to live my own life. It's to live the life he wants me to live through my life. Amen. The mission of this church is all around this church. Thousands and thousands of people. They say 30,000 people in a, a five-mile radius of this church. If Jesus was to come today, 80% of those people, by calculation, would be going to a lost eternity in hell because they don't know Jesus. I haven't come up with that statistic. Billy Graham came up with that statistic a long time ago. And they asked him, how many people do you think are going to heaven? He said, probably about 20%. What does that mean? That means that we've got a lot of people out here, a lot of people out here that need to find Jesus as Lord and Savior. And guess what? God has put our church here to make it happen. How are they going to hear the Word of God, make a change in their life, change in their families, change in their marriages, if we do not affect them with the Word of God, if we don't act like Jesus wants us to act, how are they going to find Jesus as their Lord and Savior? It is my prayer that this community will see a group of people in this church that love Jesus so much that they are willing to sacrifice their own preferences and they are willing to put away all the things, all their judgmental attitudes and to love people in this community like Jesus loved people. That's my prayer. But in order for that to happen, we've got to understand that God has given us this responsibility to reach this community. And I want to tell you today, what a privilege and what an honor that is. Do you guys really realize this today? Has this got a hold of your heart? We are living in a day. You've heard me say this, but it's true. And I want you to sink in this morning. We are living in a day where we will more than likely see Jesus Christ come back. You and I, you and I, listen, have been chosen before the foundations of the world to be living right here, right now, to be members of this church right here and right now at the end of the last charge of Christianity. This is it. I'm not trying to be a doomist. I'm trying to be a realist. And the reason that I am is because I've read the back of the book. I know how it's going to happen. Everybody says, Pastor, if we'll just select this person or that but no, no, and no. It doesn't make any difference, folks. I will tell you this. Jesus is coming back. This world is not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. And if people are going to find the Lord, it is our, right here, our responsibility as a church to show them the best example of Jesus we possibly could show them. Amen. Amen. And that means that we ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? What would he do? Those bracelets that you were given, you look down at every decision that you make in your life. You look down at every word that you might want to say. You look, and look at that bracelet and you say, what would Jesus do when it comes to... to uh, you know, working with my wife or working with my husband or working with my kids, what would Jesus do about that unforgiveness? What would Jesus do about that judgmental spirit? What would Jesus do about my finances? What would Jesus do about my lack of coming to church? In other words, what would Jesus do? And there's no area of our life that we cannot put that phrase to. You think about it for a minute. In my life, if I would just be conscious of that fact, 
And if I would let every decision in my life, everything that flows through me, if I would ask myself that one question 24-7, it would absolutely transform this pastor. What would Jesus do, Pastor Branson, about this, 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 and this? And the same would be true with you. You say, ah, pastor, I'm not going to worry about that. Well, let me say this to you in a nice, loving way. If you're not worried about this, if this doesn't be, concern you at all, you better check up on your salvation. Because if you can go through life not caring what Jesus would do, something's wrong with you. Amen. Amen. That's the way it is. There's churches all over that consciously or unconsciously, sadly, they treat and evaluate people. And a lot of people aren't welcomed and a lot of people are looked down on. And listen, it's an amazing thing that, that churches sometimes, they, they try to pick and choose who they're going to let to come in. Or sometimes we as Christians pick and choose who we're going to minister to. Let me say this to you. If the Holy Spirit tells you in your heart to minister to somebody, if he tells you to do it, you better do it. Amen. I'm not trying to put myself on a pedestal at all when I say this. But Vicki and I were in a place two weeks ago, and I had Pastor Brian with me, his wife Trish. I asked Vicki, I said, where do you want to go to eat? She said, we haven't been to Kobe's in a long while. That's one of them places where you sit down and they got that grill in front of you. And they got something really good at Kobe's called Yum Yum Sauce. <laughs> I love Yum Yummy. So I told the fellow that came out to be our chef, I says, listen, uh, I think his name was Nemo, wasn't it? Yes, Nemo. Called himself Nemo. He didn't look like a fish. But anyway, he called Nemo. And I said, Nemo, I says, I need to talk with you just a moment. We have, need to have a very serious conversation right here. He says, what is it, sir? I said, listen, you know that jug that you bring around? It's got that yummy, yummy in it. He said, yes. I said, you see them little two things, two bowl things that you put in front of me about like this and about like this? I said, they ain't going to do it. I said, listen, when you give everybody else yummy, yummy, you put that jug right beside me. Pastor Brian, am I lying? And I'm dying right here. He looked at me. I said, if you do that, I'll give you a special tip. I promise. Those, I had two people over here that were a husband and wife, I guess, or dating or something. They looked at me like I was crazy. That one woman whispered to her husband, well, there goes our yummy, yummy. And, then, <laughs> and this other woman over here, she's African-American. She had, her, had a little girl there and her son. And they were celebrating a birthday. Little girl was celebrating a birthday. And you know why they do that? They come around with the trash can lid and they bang it like that. And it's unbelievable. They do that and they celebrate the birthday. Well, Vicki and I have always had a thing down through the years. She looks at me and I look at her in certain situations like that. And we have communications. It's called uh, telepathic or whatever you call it. <laughs> and I, I looked at her and she looked at me. And here's what her glance said to me. You see them three folks right there? Those African-American folks, that little girl that's celebrating a birthday? We need to buy their meal tonight. And I looked at her and I smiled because I had already felt that way. That's how you know the Holy Spirit's working. Now let me tell you about this. Again, I'm not telling you this to build me up, so don't walk right away from here saying, oh, Pastor Branson loves to boast about what him and Vicki do. No, I share this for the glory of the Lord. The Lord put it on our heart. We didn't know those people from Adam. And that lady, I, when I asked the man to give me her check, she didn't know it. Here's how God works. That lady was trying her best on her phone to pull up her Apple app to pay for that meal. She was trying her best. She looked at Vicki and she said, can you help me? I have never had this problem with my cash app before. I don't know what's going on. It must be the Wi-Fi in here. I cannot get a connection to pay my bill. I'm in bad trouble. God even takes care of Wi-Fi. Man, I tell you, when I found that out, I about, oh, I about had a Holy, Holy Ghost spirit. I tell you. So and she, when she finally found out, the waiter finally told her, that woman 
she started crying like a waterfall. I found out, and I, went, I, I got up and I said, I believe, and don't take this offenseful, but I believe you are a single mom. How did you know that? I says, Jesus told me. And I believe that you're doing your best to raise up these two kids in the nurture and admonition of the Lord because you know Jesus. How did you know that? I said, because I looked at your kids. And I knew that they had a Christian mom because of their mannerisms and how they were raised. And I'll tell you something else about you. She said, what? I said, you're barely making ends meet. And she said, how did you know that? I said, Jesus told me. She said, you don't know how long we've been saving just to come out here and celebrate my daughter's birthday. And I told her, I said, praise God. I said, listen. She said, I don't know how to thank you. I said, don't thank me. Thank Jesus. Listen, I'm just a channel. God told me to do something, and I did it. It's not because I'm a rich man. It's not because I got money to throw around. No, Jesus told me to do it, and I would say, what would Jesus do? And I did it. They went out to their cars. They were crying all the way out their cars. Woo. I, got in, I got in my truck, and I'll tell you what, I just had a, had a moment of just galling myself because I said, Lord, gosh, Lord, I'm not telling you that I always get it right. I'm not trying to t- tell you that when you tell me to do things that I always do it 100%, but praise God that I was in the right spirit with you that I did not miss that blessing because I'll tell you one thing, folks, that was worth more than somebody giving this pastor $10,000. I, I just I, I went away from that to say, thank you, Jesus, for giving me an opportunity of being a channel of your love and a channel of your blessings and to let those kids know that there's still some Christian people. There's still some folks that are a different color that love people like Jesus loves people. Amen. Amen. And I will tell you this. That was all introduction. Listen. <laughs> in your notes, in his birth, Jesus identified himself with the poor. That's what we're going to be talking about this morning. The poor, the downcast, and the disadvantaged. Look, if you would, at Luke chapter 14, verses 12 through 14. Then he turned to the host. The next time you put on a dinner, don't just invite your friends and family and rich neighbors, the kind of people who will return the favor. Invite some people who will never get invited out. The misfits from the wrong side of the tracks. You'll be and experience a blessing. They won't be able to return the favor, but the favor will be returned. Oh, how it will be returned at the resurrection of God's people. It's a very amazing thing to understand that when Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords, he did not come and stay at the Ritz-Carlton. He didn't come and stay at all these big fancy hotel chains. No. If there was a Motel 6, he'd have stayed at the Motel 1. Amen. And they wouldn't leave the light on. Some of you are younger folks saying, what in the world is he talking about? There wasn't any fancy linens. It was a dirty, filthy, stinking place it was full of poop it was full of flies it was a place where you and I would never ever in a million years go to or tell somebody else to go to but yet it was a place where Jesus wanted to be he picked where he was going to be born It wasn't Mary and Joseph. They were just the instruments. He'd already told them where he wanted to go. He didn't verbally say that, but he told them in the spirit. He had already arranged it that every other place would be shut down. They wouldn't have room for him. He arranged the very place that he was going to go. Why would he do something like that? Because his birth defined what his mission was in life. That's what did it. His birth defined everything. 
His mission on this earth was not to necessarily the kings and the queens, the affluent, but his ministry, as you read the word, was to the poor. It was to the disadvantaged. It was to the handicapped. It was to someone like the lady at Samaria that was a prostitute, that she was so shunned in that town that she had to come and get water at 12 noon. And she had to come at 12 noon because that was the hottest part of the day. And she knew nobody else would be at that well except for her. And Jesus told the disciples one day, I must needs to go through Samaria. And the disciples said, you ain't got no business going to Samaria. There's a bunch of people in there. You, I want to tell you, hey, look, they're not the kind of folks that you want to be dealing with, Jesus. I mean, they got prostitutes there. They got people there that... Beat their wives, beat their husbands, beat their kids, beat their dogs, beat their cats. Does all, all the kinds of stuff. They're despicable. And Jesus says, I must needs to go through Samaria. Why? Because that lady at the well was on his heart. That lady at the well needed some encouragement. She needed to find Jesus as her Lord and Savior. He knew she was a prostitute. Many times over, many men broke up all kinds of families. But Jesus said, that woman right there, it's not going to have anybody around her at the well. That's the kind of person I am living for right there. And he showed us. Nobody wanted to be around that woman except for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There might be some of us in here today or some people watching that nobody wanted to be around you. You were scum. You had stuff going on in your life. Even your own family had, to, had maybe left you. But praise God that he saw value in you. There wasn't anything beautiful about you. There wasn't anything nice about you. In fact, you say, Pastor, if you'd have known me 20 years ago before I knew Jesus, nobody wanted to be around me. But praise God, he wanted to be around you. Amen. That lady at the well, he gave her water that will never run dry. It's a living water. I've got to go to Samaria. Why? Because that lady's soul is in the balance. We must go to this community and share Jesus with the poor with the privilege, with the underprivileged, with people that have things in their closet and past lives and whatever it might be, we must go. Why? Because their soul is hanging in the balance. And think about it. When Jesus died, he died among two very poor and two very common, common criminals. That's where he was. He could have been on, had two on the right or two on the left, but you know what? I think it's pretty neat when they put Jesus in the middle. Because I think they put him in the middle for a reason. And that was to share with us, I am dying right here between two common, ordinary, down on their luck, kinds of people and even when Jesus was buried he had to borrow somebody else's burial space because he didn't have a place so pastor what do you think Jesus would do today when a church talking about us see poor disadvantaged and hurting people what do you think this church ought to do today the answer is very simple. The same thing that Jesus did. Hear with me very, very clearly this morning. It says if we're going to be like Jesus, we must show mercy, mercy to the hurting, the lonely, and the fallen of our community. This is the mission of this church. We are not a country club. We are not just a so-so social gathering. We are dead, dead.
dead serious about keeping the main thing the main thing. The main thing, the main thing is that we reach people with all of our ministries to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We want to take as many people in this community to heaven as we possibly can. Look at our mission field, folks. Look amongst all of the houses around our church. You know what we've got here? We've got a bunch of single moms that have been left by their husbands or left by their boyfriends. They don't give a hoot. All they were was just a notch on their belt. They don't play child support. They don't even do anything to help. The kids don't even see daddy because they don't know where he is. And we've got these single moms. Some of them are coming to this church and they were looking for love in all the wrong places. And they came here to the point and they have found a bunch of people that love them. And they would say, Pastor, I made a mistake. Guess what? Get in line with the rest of us. You may not be a single mom or a single dad, but I'll tell you one thing. You may have not gotten somebody pregnant out of wedlock. And you may look at girls that come in here and they have a basketball right here. And you find out that they don't know, that they don't have a husband. You say, boy, that would have never happened in my day. Yeah, you know why? Because you're so daggum lily white, you ain't nothing, never nothing in your life that's wrong. Amen. Hey, I used to have a church like that. We had a couple of old roosters in the church. And sometimes they say, cock a doodle do and voice their opinions. I'll tell you this. They didn't know where them young women had come from. They were sorry about what they did. They asked the Lord to forgive them. But guess what? It is what it is. So what are we going to do about it, Pastor? Are we going to tell them they're a bunch of sinners? I don't think that's necessary. Because they already know they've sinned. I think what's necessary is standing up and being in the church and saying, I love you. What can we do? What can we do to help you and your baby? What does this church do? This church supports the Bay Area Pregnancy Center. What is that? There's kids today that are getting pregnant at 12 and 13 years old that are having sex. Girls are getting pregnant. And we minister to them and we send them to the Bay Area Pregnancy Center where that pregnancy center gives those girls love and support and says, you don't want to have an abortion. You want to have that baby born. If you want to keep that baby, great. If you want to give that baby up for adoption, there are families waiting for that baby. Do not kill that baby. Amen. And we show them love pregnant teenagers every which way. We've got the mentally challenged that are going on in this neighborhood. We've got people that are struggling, can't hardly make it. We've got the social disadvantaged people out there that almost find it impossible to cope. I'll tell you folks, without Jesus, it's hard to cope. And even with Jesus, it's hard to cope. We've got people that have disorders. I didn't have any disorders when I was growing up. I really didn't. I mean, what people call disorders now were just normal things to maybe me or you growing up. And it took me a while to understand because I would always think that people that had disorders, I would say, grow up, get over it. Won't you man up or woman up? Won't you just... Get a spine. But you know what I found? I found out there's some people out there that are doing the best they can, and that's the best they can do. There's people out there that have been scarred by their, kid, by their childhood. There are people out there that don't want to come into crowds. There's people out there that have anxiety. There's people out there that have depression. 
There's people out there because of the places where they are, the places where they've been, they want to blow their head off or take their life because all they have been is mistreated their whole entire life. And we sit here and we can't understand that because we haven't been there. But what we can do is when we see something like that is to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do? He would minister to those people. He wouldn't stand there and be super pious or proud and say, what is your problem? Why don't you just act like the rest of us? You know what? You're nuts. You're crazy. You're mentally imbalanced. All you do is sit around and moan and groan. Folks, let me tell you something. Somebody without Jesus, that's all they've got to do in a lot of cases. Amen. Amen. They're not stupid. They know this world's coming to an end. They're not stupid. They know that they don't have enough money to buy groceries. They know that mama ain't coming home. Daddy ain't coming home. Kids have turned to drugs. We got teenagers and gangs all around here. You say, I, I don't understand that. Why they got to be in gangs? Because they want to be accepted. Because they're not accepted at home. We got kids and teens all around that are on drugs and alcohol all around this church. We've got children and teenagers that are being molested on a daily basis all around this church. You go and pull up on your computer the people that are sexual predators and the zip codes around this church, it will blow your mind. I'm telling you, we've got that in our community. We've got infidelity. We've got husbands that are cheating on their wives left and right. We've got wives that are cheating on their husbands left and right. And you know what? They think they're doing it in secret, but they're not because a lot of times the kids know that mom and dad is sleeping around and they think those little pictures that they look at in their living room with all the family together and everybody's smiling at Easter and Christmas, they know that's a lie because they know what really mom and dad is up to. We've got the poor and the lower and the upper middle class and some that have higher incomes and we have people that are homosexual, trans, whatever you want to call it. But at all the bottom line of all of it is they do not know the love, unconditional love of our God. You'll always hear me through this pulpit. I believe homosexuality is a sin. I say it without compromise, but I will say this to you. I pray there will not be another pastor in Pinellas County that loves homosexuals and trans, trans more than this pastor. I pray there will not be another church in Pinellas County that loves the homosexual and the trans more than the Point Church. And my, my, my invite to anybody like that is come and sit on the front row. And I will tell you this, you will be loved. Amen. And if you find anybody in this church that won't love you, you come see me. And me and you are going to go have a come to Jesus meeting with somebody. Amen? Amen. Pastor, I don't understand it. Do you think I do? Do you think I understand the bathroom issues today? I don't understand it. Why? It was not that way when I was growing up. You say, that's the way that this world has gone. Yes, that's the way the world's gone. Why is the world gone that way? Because we know who's in charge of the world. And we also know what happens when you push the truth of God's word way over here. Things are going to happen. But the Lord says, regardless of what happens, you've got to love them like I love them. And that means unconditionally. This is our mission field, folks. How in the world today, how in the world can we sit here as a church 
and see the needs, see the hurts, see the people going to hell. How can we sit here and that not break our hearts in a million pieces? Our mission here at this church is to affect these people for Jesus Christ. Everything that we do around here is geared that way. Our Heart of the Point ministry that we started a while back is geared to help the hurting in our community. We have a full fellowship hall the third Saturday of every month that people are coming in and they cannot believe the hot meal and the people that give them a hug and the people that love on them and the people that give them enough groceries when they leave to feed their family. We've got a bunch of people coming in here that are just in awe struck by the love of Jesus, unconditional love of Jesus in our church. I will tell you, some churches are not like this church. But that blessing of being a blessing to people that are down and out comes with a great blessing of God. Look at Psalms chapter 44, first part of verse 1. Blessed by God's grace and compassion is he or she who considers the what? Helpless. God says if you help the people that need help, if you look at people like I look at people and you help them, guess what? You're going to be blessed. Proverbs chapter 40. 14, first, last part of verse 21. But happy, blessed, and favored by God is who is gracious and merciful to the poor. Can I tell you why God is blessing this church when other churches are going under? I've said this to many people, and I believe this with all my heart. We do two things at this church that we do super, super well. It is a mission of this church to do these two things well. Number one, to win people to Jesus. Number two, is to minister to the least of these. I want everybody that's turned away from other churches to come here. I do. I want them right here. When people tell me that coming to this church that they've not been welcomed in other churches, I had one just the other day that shared that with me. Because of how she was, they didn't welcome her. When I have people like that coming in here, and I hear the testimony that she has to say about how she was loved by you when she first came in, nothing does the heart of a pastor more. Praise God we've got people in this church that look at people like Jesus wants us to look. Praise God we've got some people in this church that when we have things that we do in our community, you rise up. Why? Because you want to be a blessing. We can't turn a blind eye to it, and we don't. Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17, it says, He who is gracious, or she, and lends a hand to the poor, lends to the Lord. And the Lord will repay him for the good deed. Proverbs 29, 7. The good-hearted understand what it's like to be poor. The hard-hearted haven't the faintest idea. <clears throat> Matthew 25, verses 42 through 45. This is a lot of churches right here that we're going to read. This is a lot of Christians right here. Look at it. For I was hungry, and you gave nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you didn't invite me in. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick, and in prison, you did not visit me with help and ministering care. Then they also, in turn, will answer, Lord, when did you see the hungry, or the thirsty, or the stranger, or the naked, or the sick, or in prison, and did not minister to you? Then he will repay to the, reply to them, I assure you and most solemnly say to you, to the extent, now this is Jesus talking, to the extent, Point Church, to the extent, members of the Point Church, that you do not do this for the one of the least of these, my followers, you did not do it for me. Now let me say something to you, and I mean it. 
God means it. You listen. The blood of this community, the blood of this community, one day we're going to be asked when we get to heaven, every one of us, individually, including me, we're going to stand before the Lord. And the Lord knows the names of everybody in this community. The Lord's going to know if we have tithed right to enable this church to minister to those people, to tell them about Jesus. We're going to be held accountable for that. And we're also going to be held accountable for the way that we as a church and we individually have witnessed to these people and done everything we can to lead these people to Jesus Christ. The Titanic years ago, you know the story, struck by the iceberg. They sent out a distress signal. That distress signal was heard by a ship a ways away. That ship had a decision to make. They heard the distress signal. Did I really hear it like that? Am I going to turn a deaf ear? Do I really get off the path that I'm on? We're going so good and turn and answer that distress signal and save who I can. I know I can't save them all. Do I do that or do I just turn away and not do anything? Here's how I look at it. Everybody that's in this community that doesn't know Jesus, they're on their way to hell. Everybody in this community that is hurting on addictions, alcohol, family issues, whatever it might be, a lot of those people maybe know Jesus as Lord and Savior, but they need support. They need encouragement. They need for the Point Church to answer the call, their distress call. Why? Because there's a lot of churches around us. You know that they don't preach the truth. You know that. That's why you're here. And there's a lot of churches that don't want to have anything to do with people that so calls they're down at the bottom of the rung and they don't want to have anything to do for that. Let me share this with you and I'm done. The first church where Vicki and I were serving, I've shared some things about it and I'll say this. When we got there, I was their youth pastor and I was in charge of children too. And I was in charge of those kids, and there was this little boy, that chubby little boy. He used to ride his bicycle around the circle part of the church because, like, in the middle of the church was a, a circle that you could walk or whatever. That little boy would ride his bike. And what he would do is he would leave skid marks all over the round part of that sidewalk. I asked somebody in the church, who's that little boy, fat little boy? Because it reminded him of me. And they said, oh, that's a kid down the road. You know how many times we've told him to get off our property and to quit making skid marks on our sidewalk? Next time you see him, Pastor Branson, you tell him he needs to go somewhere else and do that. That's like telling me to tell the kid, make double marks next time. <laughs> I invited him in one day, and I gave him a Coke. We had a Coca-Cola machine. He was hot, and I sat him down, and I said, I'm the new pastor here for kids and students. What's your name? And he shared with me that his name was Sam. I said, Sam, where do you live? He said, I live down about three streets. Does your mom and dad come here to church? No. Do you come here to church? No. I said, would you like to start coming here to church? I don't know if I can. Why? Why? Some people have told me that they don't like me being around here because I leave too many skid marks on the sidewalk. I said, Sam, 
you start coming to church this Sunday. You bring your bike in here. You park your bike right there. And I promise you, nobody's going to get on you anymore about the skid marks. He started coming. He had been there about three weeks. We had vacation Bible school. And Vicki and I had gotten to know him. We found out that he was way, way under class as far as economic position was. He had holes in all his jeans. That's before holes in jeans were a classic thing like they are today. <laughs> little boy always ran, wore almost the same t-shirt all the time. Scrubby little kid. Looked like he loved to play in the mud. Vicky and I got together and we said, Sam, we want to take you to Sears. He asked his mom if that would be okay. But she said, why do you want to take Sam to Sears? I said, because we want to buy Sam some new clothes. Will that be okay? She couldn't believe it. We took him to Sam, to Sears. I don't know how much we bought him. Not a lot because we didn't have anything either. But we got him a couple of pairs of jeans and a couple of shirts. I had Sam set up with me for vacation Bible school every day for five days. That's back when you did it for five days. On Friday night, when I gave the invitation, Sam raised his hand. And Sam came to know Jesus as his Lord and Savior. My mom and dad <coughs> were living in St. Pete, and we were in Lakeland. That was back before cell phones. That was back before fire signals. We got home one day, one night, and my recorder was blinking. I had a message. It was Sam's mom. She said, Pastor Branson, you need to get over here quick. Something has happened to Sam. I got in my car, and I went over. And forgive me for a minute. As I got close to his house, he lived down on a cul-de-sac. There were cars all around that cul-de-sac. And I said, oh, no, please, no, Lord. I got up to the door. People were crying. And um, I went in. His mom says, you know how Sam likes to go hunting, Pastor? I said, yeah. He went out with my older son. My son has one of them great big four by fours, big old truck. My son says, Sam, go back and get my shotgun. Sam went, he got the shotgun. Poor little kid was so short and stout. He got up in the truck. He jumped out of the truck and out of there because he just couldn't get down flat and when he did, the butt of that shotgun hit the ground and went off and shot Sam point blank. Shot him right, right in the face. Sam was dead. I did his funeral. First funeral I ever did. Sam. But I'll say this to you. I know where Sam is today. Amen. There's people in this community today. They might not be named Sam. But they got issues. They got problems. And there's some churches around that would say, don't you come into our church. We've got it this right. And you come in here, you'll make all the things wrong that we've got all so right. God help people like that. God help churches like that and pastors like that. But when I get to the point of looking at people sometimes that I look at, 
And I even have an inkling in my heart that I'm not going to tell them about Jesus or I'm not going to do what I need to do so that these people can find Jesus. I think of saying, and I said, Lord, I'm so thankful that I told that little fat kid that made skid marks all around that church that Jesus loved them. And I'm trying to share that with you this morning. What would Jesus do? Jesus could not look at our community in the way that it is right now and not do everything he possibly could to win them to Jesus. I'm sorry I got a little choked up today. You know that I can get emotional at times. But this just hits hard to me, folks. And I'll say this to you in closing. <clears throat> and I say this with all the, all the love I have in my heart. I mean, I mean, don't go out of here and say, Pastor Branson's is getting on me by not. Listen, if you haven't got your, if you haven't got your, and I wasn't going to say this today, but I'm going to say it because God wants me to say it. If you haven't got your tithing statements for the first quarter, you're going to be getting them. Inside the tithing statement is a letter from me. It's one of the most heartfelt letters that God's ever had me to write. And I wrote it to you. And here's what I said. I shared about all the great, wonderful things that God's doing around here. But you know what? And I mean this. If people in this congregation don't step up, and if you don't start doing what you need to do in this church financially, if you don't start giving your 10% that God has given to you, and that means 10% of the, all the income that you make, if it is not going to this church, this church is so far right now is 30% behind already this year in our tithes and offerings. Here's what's going to happen. This community is not going to be able to have the ministries that this church could offer. Every one of us that are not doing what we ought to do in this church, you, you are going to be held accountable one day for your disobedience. Because through your disobedience, people in this community are not being able to hear the word of God. What are you saying? I'm saying that this church needs to tithe. If you love Jesus, if you love people like Sam or others in our community that are hurting, you need to give. I don't ask you to do something that I'm not doing. Vicki and I are giving far, far, far more than tithe. And I don't say that bragging. I'm saying that because I want to do everything I can as a pastor to be able to win this community to Jesus. We can't function without it. We don't get money from anywhere else, folks. It's got to come from you. There's not going to be another last charge of the church. This is it. And we're right here in the middle of it. I love each and every one of you. You know I do. And I wasn't going to say this today. And I, I, If this offended you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. But I'm only telling you what God's Word's telling you. And I wouldn't be a good pastor if I didn't tell you that. And if you can't get to that level, get to, try your best to get to that level. If you're doing what you can, do what you can. But everybody needs to answer the bell. Let's stand, please, as our heads are bowed and as our eyes are closed. Our gracious Lord and our Heavenly Father, Lord, we've been talking today about a subject about what would Jesus do. Hey, thank you so much for listening to the broadcast this morning. I really appreciate you tuning in. You know, I know people have asked you a lot of questions down through your life. One can only imagine. But I'm going to ask you a question right now that is truly the most important question that anybody could ever ask you. And that question is this. If you were standing before Jesus today, and if he was to say to you, why should I let you come into my heaven? What would you say? Would you say, well, you know what? I've, I've been to church a lot. You know, I've, I've been good to people. I've given to worthy causes. You know, I, I, my mom and dad were Christians. Uh, you know, those are all good answers. Those really are good answers. But you know what? Those are not the answers that will get you into heaven. 
there is only one way to go to heaven, and that is to ask Jesus to come in to forgive you of your sins and to believe what he did for you on the cross. You know, over 2,000 years ago, Jesus loved you so much that he went to the cross. He died on the cross for your sins. That's how much he loves you. There's no greater love than anybody's ever had for you than that. That's a great statement of love. And he wants you to be with him in heaven. He wants you to be there with him for all of eternity. So how do you do that? Why don't you pray this prayer after me? Why don't you just bow your head and pray this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I want to thank you today for going to the cross and dying on the cross for my sins. I know that I'm a sinner, and I want to ask you right now to forgive me of my sins, and I want you to give me salvation. I believe that you went to the cross and that you died for me, and I want to claim you right now as my Lord and as my Savior. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Amen. If you have prayed that prayer, you have just made the most important decision that you'll ever make in your whole entire life. We would love to rejoice with you. Would you please do me a favor? Would you just please give me a call here at the church or send me an email and just say, Hey, Pastor Branson, I watched the sermon and I asked Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. We would just like to rejoice with you. We're here to help you. Anything I can do to help you, anything this church can do to help you, we are here to help you in any way we possibly can. Thank you again for tuning in. May God bless you.